Welcome to Present Perfect. No grammar, but plenty of history. I'm Don Congdon, your host and guide, helping you explore how the past reaches out and touches the present. This is podcast number 220 of the series entitled Inflection Point, The Church of the First Century. Last time we left a rather startled and nonplussed Saul standing on the road outside the Syrian city of Damascus. Just a few minutes before, he was about to wind up a journey which had probably taken him at least a week. Plans of threats and murder against the members of the very early church who had taken refuge in that city most likely filled his mind. Suddenly, without warning, Jesus Christ had intervened and altered his life in a spectacular way. Saul's plans came to a halt, and he realized that not only had his life changed, but the experience had left him blind. His response was sensible. Assisted by his traveling companions, he went to his lodgings at the home of a man named Judas and spent the next three days in fasting and prayer. Clearly, he had a lot of mental and spiritual rearranging to do. Meanwhile, Jesus Christ was convincing a disciple named Ananias to take a big risk, go visit the church's most aggressive persecutor, and restore his sight. Ananias was, unsurprisingly, skeptical, but obeyed. Interestingly, the Lord told Ananias a little about Saul's future role in early church history as Acts chapter 9 verses 15 through 16 tells us. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer in behalf of my name. The passage tells us that the Lord let Ananias know that Saul was expecting him. He has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. I'm sure Ananias was anything but comfortable when he entered Judas' house and asked to see Saul. Small and unimpressive as he was, Ananias knew that Saul was a dangerous enemy. We also know that word of Saul's mission to Damascus had preceded him, so Ananias' obedience shows both bravery and faith. Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like fish scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. That's all we know about Ananias. Who he was and why God chose him for this mission out of all the members of the Damascus congregation is unknown. This is his one and only appearance in the scriptures but he's certainly worthy of our respect for his courage and willingness to take a big risk for the Lord. Paul mentions his encounter with Ananias in slightly more detail when he addressed the angry mob at Jerusalem, which Luke records in Acts chapter 22. It's interesting to note that Ananias was not an apostle nor a key leader in the Jerusalem church, yet God allowed him to confer the Holy Spirit on Saul something reserved for the apostles at this stage in the very early church's history. Theologian Homer Kent offers a possible explanation by suggesting that God worked in this way because Saul was himself to be an apostle. Had one of the eleven apostles conferred the Holy Spirit on Saul, it would have suggested that he was a lesser apostle. Paradoxically, by having an ordinary believer perform this task, God made it clear that the Holy Spirit came directly from him and not via apostolic agency. This explanation makes sense to me. Meanwhile, the restored and re-energized Saul took off like a house on fire. He redirected his zest for persecution into proclaiming the truth, as Acts chapter 9 verses 19 through 21 relates. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. 
All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not the one who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name, and had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Despite his past, the Damascus congregation doesn't seem to have had difficulty accepting Saul. Probably Ananias paved the way for him. That and his vehement proclamation of Jesus as Israel's Messiah undoubtedly carried weight. And now we come to a challenging and murky part of Saul's life. If we had nothing but Luke's account to go on, everything would be simple and straightforward. But Paul drops a few tantalizing remarks into Galatians chapter 1, which tell us that Luke compressed his account. Let's look at Paul's account and combine it with Luke's to establish a complete picture and chronology. Paul tells us, But when he who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Paul explains that after his conversion and a short period in Damascus, he didn't do what would have seemed logical and sensible, return to Jerusalem and introduce himself to Peter, John, and the other apostles resident there. I'm sure that would have been interesting. Instead, he headed off to an undisclosed location in Arabia and spent an unknown period of time alone with the Lord receiving intensive training. Although Saul was well-schooled in the Old Testament scriptures, he needed the same information and foundational theological structure that the other apostles had received during their three years with Jesus. Paul alludes to this training in the same Galatians passage. For I would have you know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel which was preached by me is not of human invention, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. This passage supports Kent's hypothesis that God kept Saul apart from the other apostles so his message would in no way seem derivative. Instead, it came straight from the Lord, just as had theirs. In other words, Saul was their equal in apostolic authority and training. His unique ministry to the Gentiles carried just as much validity as theirs did to the Jewish people. These ideas also fit with the criteria specified in Acts chapter 1 when the disciples chose Matthias to replace Judas Iscariot. A true apostle must have seen Jesus after his resurrection and received direct instruction from him. Saul met both requirements. Interestingly, after his time in Arabia, Saul still didn't go to Jerusalem, but returned to Damascus and acquired disciples of his own. Luke's account, which omits the Arabia interval, picks up here in Acts chapter 9, verses 22 through 25. But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were also closely watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him at night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. When writing 2 Corinthians about 21 years after his conversion, Paul adds a detail to this incident. In Damascus, the ethnarch under Eretus, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascenes in order to seize me, and I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and so escaped his hands. An ethnarch could be a ruler over a region or a people group. He would derive his authority from and report to a higher ruler, in this case, Eretus IV, who was king of the Nabataeans. These were an Arabian people group who may have had a significant presence in Damascus. Interestingly, historians are not exactly sure what Eretus's ruling role was in Damascus. Some think he briefly took control of the city around AD 37. 
Others speculate that he ruled the Nabataeans who lived within Damascus through the unnamed ethnarch whom Paul mentions. Apparently, Saul had so irritated the local Jewish authorities in Damascus by his abrupt volt fas that they decided he had to go. Obtaining the ethnarch's cooperation, they laid a trap for Saul, planning to assassinate him should he attempt to leave the city. Going off on a tangent for a minute, I wonder what the high priest and other religious leaders in Jerusalem thought about Saul's failure to return with captives in tow. Surely his long absence would have excited some comment. I'm also curious as to how much they heard back from Damascus. I guess we can't know for sure, although we certainly do know how they reacted to Saul the next time he showed up in Jerusalem. Now we come to the sticky bit of Saul's chronology. Back in the Galatians chapter 1 passage, Paul tells us what happened after his escape from Damascus. Then, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him for 15 days. But I did not see another one of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Does the three years he mentions indicate the total time between his conversion and his return to Jerusalem? Or does it refer to the time that he spent in Damascus after Arabia? Historians haven't reached an agreement. Here's the chronology I'm proposing. Take it with a grain of salt. Saul's Damascus Road experience happened in A.D. 35, about a year after Stephen's martyrdom. He spent a short time in Damascus and then went to Arabia. We have no idea how long he spent there, but most think it was at least a year. If so, he returned to Damascus in A.D. 36 or 37. He then spent three years teaching, arguing, and making enemies. His escape and return to Jerusalem therefore happened between A.D. 39 and 40. What we do know for sure is that Saul was regarded with deep suspicion by everyone when he returned to Jerusalem, as Luke tells us in Acts chapter 9. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried repeatedly to associate with the disciples, and yet they were all afraid of him as they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus at Damascus. The Jerusalem church's reaction to Saul is hardly surprising. Clearly, most believed that Saul's conversion was just a cunning trick to get to the inner circle. We can infer from the passage that Saul did not immediately get access to the apostles. Perhaps they even went into hiding. Not until Barnabas decided to trust Saul did they grant him access to Peter, as the Galatians passage mentions. Saul spent 15 days with Peter, presumably convincing him of his bona fides and explaining the ministry that God had revealed to him over the past four or five years. We also know that he met James, Jesus' half-brother, who was an important leader in the Jerusalem church. Significantly, he didn't meet John or any of the other apostles, presumably somewhere in other cities. Perhaps those resident in Jerusalem remained undercover in case Saul's conversion was indeed nothing more than a trap. Whatever the case, Saul didn't meet them at this time. We can assume the meeting with Peter went well, however, for Paul doesn't say anything to the contrary. But Saul wasn't the kind of person you wanted to keep in Jerusalem. In a mere 15 days, he made plenty of enemies. Probably the religious leaders weren't too happy that their golden boy had been turned to the other side. I'm guessing that many of the Pharisees were disgusted too. And Saul wasn't popular with the Hellenized Jews, as Luke tells us. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. Clearly, Saul had to go elsewhere. That's what happened. Now when the brothers learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. Now, before you label Saul as cowardly, we need to add a final piece to the puzzle. Many years later, 
Paul gives us one final detail about his 15 days in Jerusalem. Luke documents it in Acts chapter 22, verses 17 through 21. It happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance, and I saw him saying to me, Hurry and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I also was standing nearby and approving and watching over the cloaks of those who were killing him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Saul's willingness to follow the good advice of the Jerusalem church stems from direct revelation. Not only did the Lord let Saul know that he was wasting his time arguing with the recalcitrant members of Israel, but he gave him specific instructions to prepare for his future ministry to the Gentiles. And that was that. Saul left Jerusalem, probably to everyone's relief. He returned to his home city of Tarsus in Cilicia. From the Galatians chapter 1 passage, we also know that he spent some time in Syria as well. He probably worked amongst the Hellenized Jews and Gentile proselytes to Judaism, since pure Gentiles had not yet started to enter the church. And his greatest outreaches to the Gentiles were still some years in the future. But for now, we're done with our friend Saul. He won't reappear in this decade, but I've got plenty to say about him when he returns. Luke sums up Saul's departure with a sense of relief that's as clear now, 2,000 years later, as it must have been in A.D. 39. So the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed peace as it was being built up, and as it continued in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it kept increasing. We're almost done with the very early church's first decade. Next time, we'll wrap it up and summarize its key qualities and characteristics. So until next time, I'm Don Congdon, and this is Present Perfect. Have a great day. Present Perfect is a copyright of Don Congdon. Music is copyright footage firm incorporated. Scripture quotations are from the New American Standard Bible, which is a copyright of the Lachman Foundation. This podcast is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Just search for Present Perfect Church History.